Welcome to a Life School presentation. A look at the Colosseum, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. On December 20th of AD 69, under the command of Titus Vespasian, Antonius Primus, and Cornelius Fucius led the Danube legions of over 30,000 men to overtake Rome. The following day, the Senate confirmed Vespasian as emperor. Until Vespasian's arrival, Mucianus, governor of Syria, ruled on his behalf along the emperor's younger son Domitian, who had been in Rome throughout the battles. Vespasian traveled to Rome, leaving his oldest son Titus behind to capture Jerusalem, and arrived in Rome on October AD 70. He was nearly 61 years old, but was still very fit and active. Soon after, Titus brought an end to the Jewish revolt and in North Syrialis defeated the Gallo-German uprising at Augusta Trevivorum. In effect, Vespasian, an old military veteran, was a man who could finally deliver peace to the empire. He possessed the insight and the sense of how to maintain peace. With the empire devastated by civil war, Vespasian needed to steeply increase taxation to cover the empire's vast costs. These measures soon earned him a reputation for meanness and greed. Though Vespasian was keen to lead by example and led a life free of extravagances and luxury in order not to further bankrupt the provinces. Vespasian wanted everyone to know that he cared about the people, was going to take care of them, and not live luxuriously as Nero had. He needed to gain support back from the people and raise the confidence of the Roman citizens. But how? He decided to patch up his shaky regime by building the Colosseum on the site of the past Emperor Nero's palace, or Golden House. It would be a place of entertainment where people of Rome could watch battles of wild beasts, slaves, and gladiators. The construction is said to have begun between 73 and 75 AD. The invention of concrete and the famous vaulted arch were both very new at the time. Romans were still learning how to use concrete and did not know how strong it was or how long it would last. They cautiously combined concrete and stone together to ensure long-lasting strength. The concrete was made by mixing a strong volcanic material called pozzolana with rubble, sand, and a mixture of limes. The Colosseum had four tiers. The ceilings of the passages and corridors which circled the arena on each tier consisted of vaulted arches made of concrete, but the supports they rested on were made of strong, heavy limestone. The vaulted arches made the ceilings much stronger than a flat ceiling would have been, and were added for strength for the building, without adding excessive weight. Without concrete and vaulted arches, the Colosseum could not have been built. The Colosseum was very different from any other amphitheater of its time, not only because of its massive size, but because of the fact that it was a free-standing structure. As most amphitheaters were carved into hillsides, its classical design features were meant to convey that Rome was a great and civilized nation. The large perimeter wall structure is made up of three sets of columns, Doric, the bottom, then Ionic, and then Corinthian. The uppermost section of the perimeter wall is referred to as the attic and was constructed with Corinthian pilasters, every second span receiving a window. Running the circumference of the top perimeter wall were 240 wooden beams, which supported the velarium, or awning. This was used to shield the crowds from the rain and heat, leaving the fighters in the arena exposed to all of the elements. The velarium was anchored to bollards on the ground and supported by corbels built into the upper perimeter wall. The canvas, ropes, and netting which made up the velarium were operated by hundreds of sailors employed by the Roman naval headquarters. The Roman architects and builders had to design the Colosseum to provide the biggest arena in the world, capable of holding between 50,000 and 65,000 people. Just one series of games might last over 100 consecutive days. Attention had to be paid towards crowd control. They devised an ingenious system of entrances, corridors, and staircases, allowing the crowds to enter and exit. Within the 80 separate entrances, the Colosseum could be cleared in less than 10 minutes. 
After the last gladiatorial spectacles were held in the 6th century, Romans quarried stones from the Colosseum, which slowly succumbed to earthquakes and gravity. Down through the centuries, people filled the hypogeum with dirt, rubble, planted vegetable gardens, stored hay, and dumped animal waste. In the amphitheater above, the enormous vaulted passages sheltered cobblers, blacksmiths, priests, glue makers, and money changers, not to mention serving as a fortress for the Frangipane 12th century warlords. Seating was strictly according to social class. The closer to the central arena, the higher your rank in society. The emperor and vestal virgins occupied boxes at the central, narrowest points of the stadium, while the senators would sit at the same level at the ends of the stadium. Next up were the noblemen and knights, then wealthy citizens, and lastly, the poorer citizens. Who were the people responsible for constructing this symbol of Rome? An estimated 100,000 prisoners were brought back to Rome as slaves after the Jewish War and were immediately put to work. In the building of the Colosseum, the slaves undertook the manual labor such as working in the quarries at Tivoli where the travertine was quarried. Slaves would also have been used to lift and transport the heavy stones 20 miles from Tivoli to Rome. Though teams of professional Roman builders, engineers, artists, painters, and decorators undertook the skilled tasks necessary for building the Colosseum. In AD 79, as the Colosseum neared completion, Emperor Vespasian fell ill and shortly after passed away of natural causes. Vespasian's older son Titus saw the completion of the construction and the inauguration games in AD 81. The opening ceremony is documented to have lasted 100 days and between 5,000 and 11,000 wild animals were killed. Further alterations and improvements were made by Emperor Titus's younger brother, Emperor Domitian, who included a series of underground passages and rooms called the Hypogeum. The Hypogeum is under the wooden floor of the arena and was made to lodge slaves, gladiators, wild animals, and hoists and pulley houses. The emperor also had his own private tunnel to enter the stadium, and a gallery top tier was also added to the top of the Colosseum to increase the seating capacity to around 65,000 people. In the late 16th century, Pope Sixtus V tried to transform the Colosseum into a wool factory with workshops on the arena floor and living quarters in the upper stories. Though, due to the cost, the project was abandoned after his death in 1590. The Colosseum later became a popular destination for botanists due to the variety of plant life that had taken root among the forgotten ruins. As early as 1643, naturalists began compiling detailed catalogs of the flora, listing 337 different species. By the early 19th century, the hypogeum's floor lay buried under some 40 feet of earth, and all memory of its function, or even its existence, had been obliterated. In 1813 and 1847, archaeological excavations attempting to reach it were hindered by flooding groundwater. Finally, under Benito Mussolini's glorification of classical Rome in the 1930s, workers cleared the hypogeum of earth for good. It was the amphitheater's reputation as a sacred spot where Christian martyrs had met their fate that saved the Colosseum from further depredations by Roman popes and aristocrats who were anxious to use its once glistening stones for their palaces and churches. The cathedrals of St. Peter and St. John Lateran, the Palazzo Venezia, and the Timbers River defenses, for example, all exploited the Colosseum as a convenient quarry. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our presentation on the Colosseum, and don't forget to look for our upcoming videos. You can visit us online at www.liveschoolk12.org or call us at 801-277-5433.